All right, we're right on time. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, James Letts um, uh, for his public presentation uh, uh, of his thesis work. Um, James got his Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the Univers University of Victoria in 2007, uh, only a few months off, and he came straight to graduate school here at Rockefeller in the fall of 2007, and he's been working towards his degree uh, in, in my lab uh, since a year after he arrived. And um, James has worked on a problem, a very difficult problem, called uh, a protein called voltage-dependent proton channel. Um, he began this work uh, with a postdoctoral scientist in the lab in the beginning named Sok Young Lee, who's now a professor at Duke University. Uh, several people in the lab have worked on this problem, and it turns out to be one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult problem we've worked on in the lab. Um, James, no one has worked on it with the unwavering focus that James has put on this problem. And in fact, he's become known in the lab as the last man standing on this project. Um, oftentimes in structural biology, people associate large size with difficulty, but that's not necessarily the, the case. And as you will see from James's work, that sometimes extremely difficult problems come in small packages. And in the case of the voltage-dependent proton channel, the extreme difficulty is one of physical chemistry. And as you'll see uh, and begin to understand during James's presentation, that the physical chemical problem here is in the voltage-dependent proton channel, evolution had to solve, um, in a sense, you could say, two simultaneously contradictory problems. And it's the problem of making a voltage sensor, which requires electric charge, and putting that voltage sensor in a membrane, which is a low dielectric environment. And that is where the whole problem lies with this protein and the problem that James has struggled with for five years now and in fact has become a superb biochemist uh, and biophysicist going at this from so many different angles. So um, we'll hear about this now. I also want to thank especially um, James's uh, thesis committee and the examination committee, and especially Tom DeCourcy uh, from Rush University, who is uh, the world's foremost authority on the voltage-dependent proton channel. And he's come here today uh, to, um, to give James his money's worth. So, uh, James. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rod, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to tell you about my thesis work in Rod's lab, uh, studying uh, sorry, enti oh, sorry, entitled "Structural and Functional Studies of the Human Voltage-Gated Proton Channel." So, voltage-gated cation channels have been studied uh, extensively uh, for the last 60 or 70 years. Um, focusing mostly on the voltage-gated potassium, sodium, and calcium channels. But the voltage-gated proton channel uh, is, is very different. Um, and when the gene was first cloned uh, in the Clatham lab in 2006, uh, they didn't quite know what they had, and they coined it oddity. Um, and although this name never took on an official capacity in the literature, it is stuck at the bench top. And all my tubes are labeled HO for human oddity. Um, and before I tell you what makes HV so odd, uh, I'll, I'll introduce a little bit uh, about the voltage gated cation channels family in general. So, voltage gated sodium, potassium, and calcium channels are known as 6TM channels because of their conserved six transmembrane helix topology. In the case of the voltage gated potassium channels, uh, four identical six transmembrane subunits come together in the membrane to form a fourfold symmetric uh, tetramer uh, 
and we're looking at it down uh, from the extracellular side here. Um, each six transmembrane subunit can be broken into two domains. The first four transmembrane helices form what's called the voltage sensor domain and arrange themselves around the periphery of the channel. Um, and the last two transmembrane helices shown in orange here uh, come together in the tetramer to form the pore domain of the channel, the ion conduction pathway of which uh, is through the central fourfold axis of symmetry. Um, as Rod pointed out, uh, in order to uh, sense and react to changes in the electrical potential of the membrane, the channels need to express charges. Uh, mutagenesis studies have identified these charges to be a series of positively charged arginine and lysine amino acids along the fourth transmembrane helix, uh, indicated here by these plus signs. Uh, so in order to sense the changes in the electrical potential, the channel needs these charges. But charges, due to the low electrical permittivity of the membrane, are unstable within its depths. So like most apparent physiological paradoxes, evolution has found an elegant solution, the mechanism of which we didn't fully appreciate until the elucidation of the first high-resolution structures of eukaryotic potassium channels. So shown here is the voltage sensor domain of a eukaryotic uh, voltage-gated potassium channel with the extracellular side at, towards the top. All four transmembrane helices are shown with some of the loops uh, between the helices removed for clarity. The regions that are known to undergo conformational changes uh, during gating of the channel are shown in red and the side chains of charged amino acid uh, residues within the transmembrane region are shown in, as ball and stick representation. So what's evident immediately from the structure is that the uh, positively charged residues along this S4 helix are stabilized within the membrane by negatively charged residues protruding from the other transmembrane helices. Um, these charged clusters uh, organize into two groups, one external and one internal, separated by a single hydrophobic residue, this phenylalanine uh, shown in green here. Um, although this is the only uh, confirmation of a voltage sensor domain that we have a structure of, electrophysiological measurements indicate that uh, gating occurs via transfer of one of these positively charged residues from the external uh, charge cluster across the phenylalanine gap to the internal charge cluster or vice versa. And then this conformational change is uh, transmitted to the pore via this amphipathic helix here. Um, as you would imagine, because of the uh, functional importance of this distribution of charged residues, it's highly conserved and forms a sort of signature uh, for a voltage sensor domain. And in 2006, the Clatham and Okamura labs um, used the sequences of known voltage sensing domain containing proteins to search the mouse and human genomes for unknown uh, proteins that may contain a voltage sensor domain. One of the proteins that they discovered, uh, transmembrane sequence shown here compared to that of the uh, eukaryotic shaker potassium channel, voltage-gated potassium channel, um, was coined human oddity because it was very different, and I'll tell you about it in just a second. Um, but what also they observed is when they took this gene and, and expressed it in hex cells, they could measure robust voltage-gated proton currents from those cells. Um, the physiological phenomenon of voltage-gated proton current has been studied for uh, decades, since the early 80s, um, but this was the first ever potential gene candidate, and it looked very different from the uh, voltage-gated channels I just told you about. And its difference stemmed from the fact that it, it didn't have a pore domain. It only has a four-transmembrane helix topology that is homologous to the voltage sensor domain alone. So shown here is the uh, primary uh, structure of the uh, human channel. It has a large um, acid and proline-rich uh, N-terminus that is predicted to be unstructured. The four transmembrane helices of a, of a voltage sensor domain followed by a uh, predicted coil-coil in, in, uh, in, on the C-terminus, also in the cytoplasm.
Um, so when I joined the McKinnon lab, this was basically what was known about the protein. Uh, this is its sequence. When you, uh, when you, when you express it in hex cells, you get voltage-gated proton currents. So this is an overview of the different biochemical and structural approaches that we took to try and get a better mechanistic understanding of the channel. Um, when I first joined the lab, uh, as Rod mentioned, I teamed up with a postdoc, Dr. Suk-Young Lee, who is now a professor at Duke. Um, and the first question we wanted to address was, because the channel lacks a pore domain, is it actually a channel? Is the oddity protein actually the voltage-gated proton channel? Or is it associating with some other unknown factor in the hex cell membranes that facilitate proton conduction? So to, do, to address this, uh, we developed a, a methodology for the, pure, for the expression and purification of the protein, and then reconstituted it into lipid vesicles, and examined the uh, proton conduction activity of the channel with a fluorescence-based concentrative uptake flux assay. So how we do that is we uh, reconstitute the protein uh, in the presence of high potassium, and then dilute it into, uh, dilute the vesicles into low uh, potassium sodium buffer. Then when we, uh, and in the presence of this fluorescent dye, ACMA. So just looking at a fluorescent, uh, just looking at the fluorescence, you get a nice stable uh, fluorescent signal um, until the addition of the potassium ionophore valinomycin, which makes the membranes permeable to potassium, allowing it to flow down its concentration gradient, generating a negative electrical potential inside the vesicles. So if there is a conduction pathway for protons through the membrane, um, protons will flow into the vesicles uh, to compensate for this negative potential. Uh, they'll protonate uh, the fluorescent molecule, ACMA, and quench its fluorescence. Um, so as you can see here, uh, in, the pres in, in, in vesicles that contain the oddity protein, um, you see a uh, rapid fluorescence quenching. And in vesicles that do not have any protein uh, in the membrane, uh, you don't see uh, any quenching at all after the addition of valinomycin. Um, to bring the reaction to completion, you had the small molecule CCCP, which makes the membranes permeable uh, to protons. In the case of the empty vesicles, you see immediately a very rapid uh, fluorescence quenching to baseline, indicating um, that the potassium gradient was well formed. And in the, in the case of uh, vesicles containing protein, um, you see an additional small drop in fluorescence, indicating that some fraction of the vesicles uh, contained, or sorry, some fraction of the vesicles did not contain any functional channel, channels. Excuse me. Um, so clearly, the oddity protein is capable on its own of conducting protons. But what this doesn't tell us is what fraction of the proteins from the purification are actually functional. And does this correspond to all of the proteins being functional that we reconstitute, or only a very small fraction, 1% or you know, 10%? Um, and this is, of course, a very important question if we want to do uh, you know, more biochemical and structural characterization of the purified protein. Um, in order to address that question, uh, sorry, of course, this is the first demonstration that the oddity protein alone is responsible for proton conduction. So in order to address the, uh, the question of what fraction of channels are functional, uh, you can do a dilution series in which you add less protein uh, to the same amount of lipid, uh, essentially diluting out the average number of proteins uh, per lipid vesicle. Um, and that's what's shown here. And then because we know the st statistical distribution of channels in, into vesicles, uh, we can make a plot of the uh, a ratio of the relative fluorescence due to HV channels, which is the, the drop after the addition of valinomycin, but before the addition of CCCP, uh, to the total fluorescence, which is the difference uh, in the baseline, uh, versus the expected number of channels per vesicle. Um, and then you can fit it to this equation. Um, uh, so this red line is, a, is this equation uh, with a value of, uh, of one which would indicate that all of the uh, channels from the reconstitution are functional. As you can see, it fits relatively well, indicating that 
um, a majority of the channels from our reconstitution uh, are, are functional and that the purified protein would make good target uh, for uh, further biochemical and structural characterization. Uh, the next question that Sukyung and I wanted to address was uh, what was the multimeric state of the channel in the membrane? Um, because as, we, as I showed you, voltage-gated potassium channels are tetramers, but the tetramerization interface is entirely made up of the pore domain with the voltage sensor domains on the periphery. So in the absence of the pore domain, how do HV channels arrange themselves in the membrane? Um, to address this, uh, we expressed the, cell, uh, the channel in hex cells. Uh, we, we purified the membranes, and then we subjected the membranes to uh, the nonspecific crosslinker uh, disexinomidyl suberate. Um, as you can see on this anti-HV western blot, uh, as we increase the concentration of DSS, um, the band corresponding to the molecular weight of a dimer disappears, and the band corresponding to the molecular weight, sorry, of a monomer disappears, and the band corresponding to the molecular weight of a dimer uh, a, a appears, indicating that in the membrane the channel is a dimer. To further uh, probe the dimer interface, how the dimer is arranged in the membrane, uh, we mutated away the two native cysteines uh, that were present to make a cystless background, and then strategically mutated uh, cysteine residues at different positions along all four of the transmembrane helices and into the coiled coil, <coughs> some of which are indicated here um, by these dots on the schematic. So in the presence of uh, reducing reagent, uh, none of these uh, cysteine mutant channels run as dimers, but if the cysteine lies along the dimer interface, uh, by subjecting the channel to oxidizing conditions, a spontaneous disulfide bond should form, which would allow us to detect uh, dimer formation on non-reducing gels, uh, as shown in this western blot. And what we found is that at two positions, uh, we saw very strong formation of dimer. One, at a native cysteine position, uh, 249, in the coiled coil, and a second one uh, at the top of S1 at position 127, which indicated that the S1 helices uh, in the membrane are, are very close together. And further immunogenesis studies, not shown here but published, allowed us to propose this model of how the HV dimer is arranged uh, in the membrane in which the S1 helices contact each other uh, in the membrane and then the dimers held together in the cytoplasm by the coil coil. So we knew due to the uniqueness of the channel that the field would benefit greatly from a structural characterization um, of the channel, um, but also any construct that we went after the structure of, we wanted to ensure uh, it was a functional construct. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how we went about defining uh, a construct that we could use for structural studies and, uh, and, and how we uh, functionally characterize it. So um, the main method that I'll be showing you for function uh, is known as uh, whole cell patch clamping. In this case, uh, we express the channel in hex cells, um, and then uh, we use a glass electrode um, that which we attach to the cell um, that, and that which forms a very strong seal due to the uh, interactions of the lipid and the glass um, with a giga-ohm resistance. Uh, and then you can apply a, a small burst of pressure to break the membrane uh, between the electrode uh, and, and the cell on the inside of the electrode, um, which gives you complete excuse me, which gives you complete electrical access uh, of, the, of the complete electrical control over the cell membrane, and also due to the uh, much, much greater volume inside the electrode, this image is not to scale, uh, compared to the cell volume, you can completely exchange the, the uh, cytoplasmic buffer uh, with the electrode buffer. Um, and then what we do is we do what's called voltage steps. We hold the uh, electrical potential of the membrane negative, in this case minus 60, then we uh, depolarize slightly, stepping to a, po a more positive um, uh, potential, and hold that for a certain amount of time, and then step back to the holding potential at the end. And what we can measure is any current that is elicited uh, from the cell membrane uh, during that voltage step. 
And we just do this repeatedly, um, taking steps of voltage um, between minus four, 10 millivolt steps between minus 40 and plus 60 in this case. And what we get is what we call a current family. Um, and this tells us a lot about um, the voltage dependence and the kinetics of the gating of the channel. So the data shown here is for the wild type channel at symmetric pH. This schematic I put up to let you know that the channels that I used were tagged N-terminally uh, with GFP. It has been shown that putting a GFP on the N-terminus of the channel doesn't affect, doesn't significantly affect its function. Um, so how uh, we go about quantitatively looking at the gating, the voltage dependence of the gating of the channel is we plot what's called a uh, voltage, uh, sorry, a current voltage plot or an IV curve. So along the bottom is the step potential. Uh, so this is the part, uh, this is this part of the protocol, uh, the, the voltage at which we step to um, during the step. And on the y-axis, uh, we plot the normalized tail currents. So the tail current is the current that's elicited after the voltage step when we step back uh, to, the hold, to the resting potential. And the reason why we use the tail current is because during the voltage step, two parameters are changing, the fraction of open channels and the voltage. Whereas by stepping back always to the same voltage, the only thing that's changing is the fraction of open uh, channels. And by convention, uh, you invert the current such that the values are positive on the plot. Um, and shown here, is the IV curve um, for the wild type channel at uh, symmetric pH 6.5 across the membrane. And what you can see from this plot is that the channel doesn't begin to open uh, until depolarizations of about 20 millivolts. One more thing I'd like to discuss briefly um, is what's known as the Nernst equilibrium potential. So the Nernst equilibrium potential for protons is the potential at which there is no driving force for proton current across the membrane. It's also known as the reversal potential because um, at voltages um, to, the, uh, to the left of it, uh, the driving force for proton conduction would be inward, and you'd see inward current during the voltage step. And to, at voltages to the right of it, the driving force for protons would be outward, and you'd see outward current, like we see uh, in this, in this uh, family. Um, because the channel doesn't begin to open until um, to the right of the equilibrium potential. So just keep that uh, value in mind, um, and I'll bring, come back to it. So one thing we can do uh, with the whole cell patch clamp technique is perfuse the external buffer. And this allows us to examine how the channel gating is affected by changing, um, uh, I, uh, the, 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 in this case, the pH of the buffer. So I've, held, I've highlighted the internal pH, because that remains constant. Um, but if we change the external pH to 6.0, uh, what you can see is that the gating of the channel uh, has slowed down uh, significantly. Um, and the uh, voltage dependence of gating has shifted uh, to the right, indicating that stronger depolarizations are needed in order to open the channel. And the channel doesn't begin to open until about uh, plus 40 millivolts here. So if we do the opposite and we change the external pH uh, to pH 7, uh, what you can see, again, the channel gating is, is affected and the uh, voltage uh, dependence of gating shifts to the left, indicating that, that uh, weaker depolarizations will open the channel. And the channel begins to open at around minus 10 millivolts here. So when we compare uh, what we see here to the Nernst equilibrium potential for protons at these three different transmembrane pH gradients, uh, we see an interesting trend. And what that is, is that the channel shifts its voltage gating such that it only ever opens when the electrochemical potential for protons is for outward current. The channel never opens to allow protons to flow into the cell. The uh, this is known as uh, outward rectification. Um, and this really defines its physiological uh, roles. In um, the phagosomes of, of uh, macrophages, the channel is associated uh, with the NADPH oxidase, uh, whose activity is important for bacterial killing, but also results in both acidification of the cytoplasm and depolarization of the membrane. When these channels, 
open in response to that depolarization, they uh, dump protons into the phagosome, um, deacidifying the cytoplasm, and repolarizing the membrane, allowing for the sustained activity of the oxidase. Um, in sperm cells, these channels are highly expressed and are involved in the process which is known as, as uh, capacitation. This is the process by which sperm cells go from a quiescent state in the male reproductive system to an actively swimming state in the female reproductive system and is preceded by a large proton dump out of the sperm cytoplasm. So clearly this feature of, the, so clearly HV channels are both voltage and transmembrane pH gradient gated. And you can change the internal pH holding the external pH uh, constant and see the exact same phenomenon. Um, and the mechanism, is, me mechanism of this is unknown. Uh, there are some models of how the channel uh, might achieve this, um, but the amino acid residues involved, the, the, the residues that are the proton receptors on the extracellular and intercellular surfaces of the channel are unknown. So we knew that uh, a, a structural characterization of the, of the channel would also help us in, dev in devising experiments to understand this interesting biochemical uh, phenomenon. So Sukyang was able to grow uh, some small crystals of this full-length channel. Um, however, they only diffracted to about 10 angstroms, and we knew that we would have to alter the construct um, in order to get better diffracting crystals. Uh, so how we go about doing this, uh, it's well established that due to structural heterogeneity, unstructured regions of proteins are, um, inhibit crystallization. Um, and we knew that the N-terminus of the protein is very acid and proline rich and predicted to be unstructured. Um, so we did a limited proteolysis experiments. So we just take the protein in detergent, mix it with a small amount of protease, and then uh, qu quench the reaction and do mass spec analysis to determine where those proteases are cutting. And this allows us to define any st structural core elements of the protein. So shown here is a mass spectra of trypsinized protein, uh, which indicated to us that there are two main cut sites uh, for the protein. One on the N-terminus that defines uh, the, the N-terminal boundary of the structured transmembrane region, and one uh, between the uh, transmembrane region and the C-terminal coil coil. This site was unanticipated because of the known role of the coil coil in the dimer interface, but clearly uh, there is a flexible linker between the coil coil and the transmembrane domain. So this allowed us to define the structural core of the protein as the transmembrane region itself. And we use that information to, to, to design four constructs. The wild type construct, uh, the C-terminally truncated construct that lacks the coil coil, N-terminally truncated construct, and the doubly truncated construct. Um, before we went after any of these structurally, we wanted to ensure that they were still functional voltage-gated proton channels. And remember, we also want to understand this physiological uh, phenomenon, a physiologically important phenomenon of, of delta pH gradient gating as well. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the, all of the constructs had that, uh, capa that, had that uh, capability still too. Um, so shown here is the data for the N-terminally truncated construct. You can see the gating of the channel is, is slower than wild type, um, and that the delta pH uh, gating is actually shifted somewhat to the left, um, and at high extracellular proton concentrations or low pH, you can actually start to see some inward currents. Um, the C-terminally truncated uh, channel also, uh, the gating was affected, um, and the, the voltage gating, and the um, delta pH uh, gating was actually shifted more to the right, making it an even you know, stronger outward rectifier. Um, the doubly truncated construct, uh, the, the, the gating is much faster, um, but the uh, delta pH dependence of, ga of gating is actually much more similar to wild type uh, than the other two constructs. Um, so clearly the take home message from this slide is that they're all functional voltage gated channels and they're all delta p uh, pH uh, gated, which means they're, you know, adequate targets to go after um, for structural understanding of these two mechanisms. But also, in addition, we wanted to ensure that 
uh, the, the, these um, altercations to the, to the protein uh, didn't result in uh, leak of other ions through the channel. So very small perturbations in the channel have been shown. Uh, single point mutants have been shown to allow uh, other ions to leak through the channel as well. Um, so how we do that is we look at the reversal potential of the current elicited um, by the voltage steps and compare it to what's predicted for the Nernst equilibrium potential for protons at the three different uh, uh, transmembrane pH gradients. Um, so in the black line is what is expected from theory for the Nernst equilibrium potential, and in the, the colored dashed lines are each of the four different constructs, including a wild type in blue. Uh, and what we can see is that uh, none of the channels differ significantly from wild type or uh, from the Nernst uh, equilibrium potential. And it's thought, essentially, that the channel is perfectly selective for protons, and that any deviation we see is due to our inability to perfectly control uh, uh, proton concentration in our buffers. So I biochemically characterized all four of the constructs, and it turned out that the doubly truncated construct uh, was the most stable. Um, I expressed it as a N-terminal uh, GFP fusion, but during the protein purification, I cleave off the GFP, uh, leaving just a sequence uh, derived from uh, the HV uh, transmembrane region. Um, I purify the channel in desomaltoside detergent, um, but then in order to stabilize the channel, I need to exchange it into a lipid-like detergent, uh, lysopalmitoyl phosphoglycerol, also known as LPPG. Um, and shown here is the uh, final detergent exchange step of the purification in which I'm exchanging from DM to LPPG. Uh, as you can see, it, it uh, elutes as a monodispersed peak, uh, but, that, but it is quite broad, about five mils. But when I concentrate and rerun it uh, the next day, it elutes as a very sharp peak uh, that's very stable um, for uh, up to a week at high concentrations. This is at six mg per mil. And this gel indicates that the channel uh, is highly enriched, which, which tells us that it would make a great candidate uh, for structural uh, determination. Also, to be extra careful, we ensured that the purified channel, doubly truncated, is still functional um, after the purification by reconstituting it into lipid vesicles and using the fluorescence based flux assay I described earlier. As you can see, uh, both the wild type and doubly truncated channel uh, conduct protons um, similarly. So now I will go on to talk about my efforts to get a structure of the channel. Um, so the doubly truncated construct alone didn't crystallize, um, but so we wanted to use an approach that's common in the lab for uh, membrane proteins, uh, which was to get an antibody against the, pro against the channel and use the antibodies as crystallization chaperones. Um, antibodies have large surface areas and they form strong crystal contacts, so they can force the crystallization of proteins that wouldn't otherwise crystallize. As an added bonus, um, because of the known structure of the antibody, you're able to phase your data sets by molecular replacement. Um, and this technique has been successfully used for homologous proteins, uh, such as the isolated voltage sensor domain from the prokaryotic voltage-gated potassium channel, KVAP, structure shown here uh, in complex with an antibody. However, raising antibodies against the HV channel by mouse injection uh, didn't work. Um, this was a mystery to us, but it turns out, actually, that the HV channels play a physiological role in B cell receptor signaling. So there may be some negative selection going on uh, preventing us from uh, raising antibodies by this method. So we needed to innovate. And what we uh, decided to try was take a chimera approach. So the epitope for the um, anti-KVAP antibodies that work for crystallization is this S3B-S4 helix turn helix motif uh, known as the voltage sensor paddle. It's been shown that uh, the paddle can be transferred, can be spliced from one voltage sensing uh, domain protein to another and still produce uh, functional voltage-gated ion channels. 
So the, the plan was uh, to transfer the paddle epitope from KVAP to HV and use the anti-KVAP antibodies to crystallize the HV chimera. Um, how to make these chimeras is not straightforward. Because of the repeated nature of the arginine residues on S4, there's a number of different registers uh, for alignments that can, be, uh, that can be generated. And just based on sequence, um, there's no unambiguous way to define an alignment. Um, so we went about solving this problem by generating over 15 different constructs um, from, uh, for each, or not for each, but from these three uh, different uh, possible alignments, two of which are shown here, um, and one of which, when biochemically characterized, was the most well-behaved, uh, called the HAP5 chimera sequence uh, shown here. Of course, we wanted to make sure that the, the chimeric channel was a functional voltage-gated proton channel. As you can see, when compared to the human uh, HV channels, the chimera gating behavior is very different, which is consistent with the functional importance of this paddle epitope in channel gating. Um, but clearly, it is a voltage-gated uh, proton channel, and also the purified reconstituted channels uh, also conduct uh, protons in our flux assay. Uh, so I was able to grow crystals of this channel uh, in complex with a 33H1 uh, anti-KVAP antibody. Um, after much refinement of the crystal conditions, I was able to uh, collect a low-resolution anisotropic data set, uh, diffraction shown here in the best direction. Um, the space group of the channel was, uh, sorry, of the, of the uh, crystal was P1, and the unit cell dimensions were large enough such that eight uh, FAB channel complexes could fit in. Uh, I'm going to show you here, I was able to uh, phase the uh, data set with molecular replacement, and, I'll, and I'm showing here um, one quarter of uh, the unit cell, which is also the asymmetric unit because the space group is P1. Um, so immediately from my molecular replacement solution, uh, with two FABs shown here, uh, I could see helical density corresponding to the transmembrane helices uh, of the channel. So the sequence uh, from KVAP is shown in green, and the HV-derived sequence is shown in magenta. So if we zoom in on the channel structure, um, so we, can, we know uh, that because we know what the channel, uh, so the antibody epitope is, we know immediately that uh, the, we know which one is the S3 helix and which one is the S4 helix. But because the uh, density um, for, this low, uh, for this low resolution data set isn't uh, very good, um, the connectivity between the other two helices is unknown. Um, there are enough helices uh, for the four transmembrane helices of the channel, and we can see in the structure that the channel is arranged in a dimer. So there's eight transmembrane helices uh, uh, clustered together. What we can also see is that it doesn't look like what we expect uh, for a voltage sensing domain protein. Um, and the dimer interface in this structure is along the S3 helix. Now, if you remember from our cross-linking studies in the membrane, we found that the dimer interface was along the S1 helix, which is one of these helices on the periphery of the channel. So is this a native structure of the chimera? We know this is a functional channel, it, both in cells and when reconstituted. Um, or is this some sort of non-native structure that has been uh, generated due to all the, the perturbations that we've uh, done to the channel in order to get it to crystallize. Um, is this dimer interface what exists in cell membranes? We can test that. All you need to do is mutate in cysteine residues along the S3 and see whether or not we get any cross-linking. So that's what I did. Um, shown here is uh, data for cysteines introduced compared to wild type and the, and the chimera. Cysteines introduced on this S1, S2 linker. As you can see, under non-reducing conditions, both the wild type and chimera show an identical pattern of cross-linking, indicating that these positions are very close along the dimer. When we uh, mutate along uh, the S3 helix to cysteine, 
for the uh, chimeric channel, um, we don't see any dimer formation in membranes at all, uh, indicating that these parts in the structure that are the furthest apart are the closest together in the membrane, and the parts that are closest together uh, in the structure are actually furthest, further apart, um, which told us that this structure um, is non-native, and if we want to get a native structure of the protein, we'll have to go about it using a different method. Luckily, <coughs> excuse me, um, I was able to team up with a postdoc in the lab, Dr. Joel Butterwick, who is a NMR spectroscopist who has experience uh, working with uh, voltage sensor and domain proteins uh, since he solved the structure of the isolated voltage sensor domain of the voltage-gated potassium channel, KVAP, um, using solution state NMR and detergent. So because the HV channels are of similar size as the isolated voltage sensor domain, uh, we thought that maybe we could go about getting the structure uh, by NMR. After devising uh, methods to uh, label the protein with uh, N15 and deuterium isotopes, uh, we were able to collect a really nice uh, heteronuclear single quantum coherence spectrum, HSQC for short. Um, so each of the peaks on this contour diagram corresponds to a covalently browned proton uh, nitrogen pair. So most of the peaks are main chain amide uh, bond uh, with some side chains showing up. So these are side chains of asparagines and glutamines. Uh, these are side chains of arginines. And this is the sole tryptophan side chain uh, from the only tryptophan in the sequence. So after you have a nice spectrum like this, the next thing you need to do is determine what atoms in the protein are responsible for each of these peaks, a process known as assigning the spectrum. And there's a number of ways to go about that spectroscopically, uh, which we implemented. But another method that we used uh, was specifically labeling the protein by only adding to the growth medium uh, N5, a single N15 labeled amino acid. In this case, uh, arginine. So each of the peaks on this spectrum uh, are a subset of the peaks on the previous spectrum, but we know immediately that all the pe only peaks we see are arginine peaks. There are seven arginines in the channel structure, uh, and we see peaks corresponding to the main chain for six of them, and, uh, so, and there are seven side chain peaks here, because this larger peak is actually uh, two uh, side chains. So we did this uh, specific amino acid labeling for 12 of the 20 amino acids, and that allowed us, uh, in conjunction with the spectroscopic techniques, to fully as uh, assign 82% uh, of all the peaks on the HSQC spectrum. Um, so the position of these peaks uh, is known as the chemical shift. And the chemical shift is very sensitive to the local, envi uh, local environment of the atoms. Um, specifically, <coughs> the uh, carbon-13 um, alpha or position or, and, or, and along the main chain um, is sensitive to the backbone dihedral angle of the, uh, of the protein, of the polypeptide. Um, so um, by doing secondary shift analysis, you can learn a lot about the secondary structure of the protein. And that's what I'm showing here. So the different positions along the main chain, uh, that's known that there are characteristic uh, secondary chemical shifts for um, alpha for the different elements of secondary structure. So what we can see is that clearly there are four transmembrane helices, as we expect um, for a voltage sensor domain, as well as a short uh, N-terminal helix, um, which is coined S0. Um, S0 helices have been seen on voltage sensor domains of other, uh, of other channels. But this is the first time uh, that the S0 helix is observed for HV channels. Um, so the next thing we want to do in order to get a three-dimensional structure is get through space measurements that we can use uh, to constrain uh, our structure calculations. Um, one method in which you can do that 
is, which is what's called paramagnetic relaxation enhancement. So you introduce a stable um, free radical um, onto uh, a specifically uh, mutated uh, cysteine position in your protein, um, and the electron spin of the free radical uh, enhances the relaxation of nearby nuclei. And how this looks on your HSQC spectrum is essentially that nearby nuclei, the peaks of nearby nuclei are suppressed. And the degree of suppression gives you a measure of how close uh, the uh, nucleus is to your spin label. And as a control, you also label the protein uh, with a non-free radical uh, small molecule uh, diamagnetic probe, it's called. So what does this data um, look like? This is an example from Joel's work on the isolated voltage sensor of KVAP, um, labeled uh, at this S1, S2 uh, extracellular loop. So on the y-axis here is a ratio of the, intens the peak intensity of the spin-labeled um, spin -labeled spectrum versus the diamagnetic spectrum. And along the x-axis is the amino acid position uh, along the primary structure. Um, these red lines indicate what we would expect for signal suppression. Uh, the solid red line is for an extended coil structure, and the dashed red line is for a more compact uh, uh, alpha helical structure at the label site. And the label site on this plot is indicated by this red arrow. Um, so as you can see, the, there's strong suppression at the label site, indicating that the uh, channel is efficiently labeled. But in addition, we see strong suppression at this, in this region at the top of the S3, S4 helix, which is what we would expect for a four helix bundle protein. Uh, when we label an equivalent site on uh, the HV channel, uh, any of the blank uh, segments indicate that we were uh, unable to get uh, assignments, uh, measurements for positions there. Um, but we certainly don't see much suppression uh, in this S3, S4 helix. Um, so, of course, this is just one position. So let's see how it looks in other places. Um, what we found, you know, labeling in these three positions indicated here, uh, was that no matter where we labeled the protein, we didn't get strong uh, signal suppression in any of the other regions, except for uh, in the case of the 134C, we do see some suppression at the bottom of the S4 helix, which doesn't make topological sense for the top of S1 and S2 to be near uh, the bottom of the helix. Well, this indicated to us that although the secondary structure of the protein is preserved, the tertiary structure in detergent seems to be uh, poorly defined, and we won't be able to solve the structure uh, by solution state NMR in my cells. So what does this tell us about the protein? Essentially, it leads us to one conclusion, that the membrane is really a structural component of these channels. By extracting the protein from the lipid bilayer, uh, we're destabilizing its three-dimensional structure. And there's some constraints that the lipid bilayer is imposing on the channel that are, that are holding it together. Therefore, any future structural work will have to focus on membrane-like environments. So future crystallography uh, should focus on uh, crystallography using bicells or lipidic cubic phase. And future NMR spectroscopy studies uh, should focus on uh, solid state NMR uh, using pelleted membranes with, um, of HV reconstituted vesicles or um, by reconstituting the protein into lipid nanodisks um, and then studying it in that context. Um, I'd like to thank Rod um, for having me in his lab for the last six years. It's been a very difficult project, but it's been an extremely rewarding one. Uh, I've learned uh, an immense amount, and Rod is a fantastic advisor. Um, thank you. Um, and my colleagues, um, Dr. Suk-Young Lee, who I worked with in the beginning, and I worked very closely with Dr. Joel Butterwick uh, in, for the NMR. Um, Ernest Campbell in the lab, um, 
he is the lab manager and he basically makes sure that everything runs in the lab smoothly. He's indispensable. Um, Shun in the lab helped me with all the cell culture that I use for the electrophysiological experiments. Uh, Dina in the Structural Biology Center um, is very helpful with all the different crystallization and uh, crystallography and solution robots that we use. And all the members of the McKinnon Lab uh, for making my uh, PhD an amazing experience. Uh, everyone in the Dean's office. I'd like to thank my collaborators at the University of Toronto. I didn't speak about our work here today, but they've been very supportive. Um, and my thesis committee members, of course, uh, with a special thanks to Tom uh, for coming all the way from uh, Chicago. And my family members, some of whom are in the audience today, uh, thank you very much for coming today and showing your support. And my lovely wife, Maria, for uh, just everything. Um, and thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, Ravi? I don't think so, no. Now, when I think of a channel, I think of an, an aqueous pore. Sorry, the question was, do, do HV channels, uh, are they channels, or is there another mechanism of, of conduction? Um, I think the evidence points to HV channels um, conducting via mechanism what's called a hydrogen bonded chain, in which a proton is transferred to a specific side chain of the protein and then from a water molecule and then transferred from that side chain on the other side of the membrane to another water molecule. Um, so there's no aqueous permeation pathway. And there can be some very, you know, high, high, uh, high, um, tightly held water molecules in the pathway, but the water cannot pass through the, chan the, the protein. Yes, it's been done by, by Tom using a number of different techniques. Um, you can look at the temperature dependence of the conductance. You can look at the deuterium isotope effect of the conductance. And what you see is that there's a very strong uh, both temperature dependence and deuterium isotope effect, which indicates that there's a rate limiting step at, um, at, at conduction. And it's not diffusion limited. Um, and when you compare it, to these large values to channels that are known to operate by a water wire, a continuous water wire, versus um, channels that are known to operate by a hydrogen bonded chain mechanism, uh, you see that the values for the HV channel match much closer to those that uh, are hydrogen bond mechanism, hydrogen bonded chain mechanism, than uh, those of a water wire. So it indicates that it's uh, likely hydrogen bonded chain. Yeah? Um, there are a few isoforms, but they're quite similar. Um, one recently discovered is different only in the uh, expression of a shorter end terminus. Essentially, there's an alternate start site. Um, but it does alter the uh, gating behavior of the channel. Um, I mean, my data on the truncations suggests that there is uh, in, uh, a, a interaction between um, the end terminus and the transmembrane domain. And other data in the literature also suggests this. Most notably, from Tom's lab again, um, there's a phosphorylation site at 3 uh, 29 on the end terminus, which is quite distant from the transmembrane domain. But the phosphorylation state of that site affects the channel gating quite a bit. So clearly, there's some interaction. Yep. 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 Yeah, so the work you're referring to is from uh, Bezania's lab. Um, just to repeat the question, uh, when you mutate histidines in, in specific positions along the shaker S4 helix, 
will you, will you do see uh, that the voltage sensor becomes capable of conducting protons depending on the state of the channel. And if you get it, the position just right, um, it becomes a transporter in the sense that it only carries one proton across um, per uh, voltage gating step. There's a lot of mutations of voltage sensing domains that cause them to leak ions, including those of HV. Uh, if you mutate um, some of the arginines in shaker, you can actually conduct larger ions as well, um, sodium and potassium, and even guanidinium. Um, clearly, the voltage sensing domain is capable of containing some sort of ion conduction uh, property. When you start to mutate charged residues in a transmembrane domain, like from what we know from the structures is that there's this delicate balance of positive and negative charges that are stabilizing the ch these charges within the low dielectric of the membrane. And if you remove a charge, two things could be happening. One, maybe you're revealing a cryptic pore that exists within the voltage sensor domain itself, or two, you might be just disrupting the structure such that it makes some sort of leak pathway and it's not really uh, too, too significant. The case of the histidines is more intriguing because um, it's a more conservative mutation and when protonated, the histidines are positively charged. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think it's known that HV doesn't conduct via a histidine. Actually, the only residue that's been identified, um, again, in Tom's lab, uh, to uh, really strongly affect the conduction and selectivity of the channel is an aspartate, which is in the middle of the S1 helix and is conserved uh, for all known HV channels. Um, so it's clearly a different mechanism than what Bezania sees, um, but uh, yeah, clearly these, these protein structures can conduct, conduct. Yes, dear? Yes. Um, the evidence in the literature is shaky. A lot of people think that by removing the coil coil, you monomerize the channel in membranes. Um, and that's based on the fact that the dimeric channel full length is highly cooperative. And when you remove the coil coil, the channels no longer gate cooperatively. cooperatively. Um, however, there's also evidence that shows all you need to do to remove the uh, cooperativity is mutate a, a series of three residues in between the transmembrane domain and the coil coil to glycine, and then the channels, although they are dimers, no longer gate cooperatively. So it's possible that the channels in membranes without the coil coil are associating, um, and but not gating cooperatively. Uh, no really definitive biochemical experiment has been done that proves that the channels function uh, as monomers, though people suspect they do. I guess the best one that has been done is from the Isakoff lab, in which both the N and C terminus of the, cha of the, vol of the proton channel are replaced by um, the N and C terminus of a voltage sensor phosphatase enzyme, um, and they show uh, using uh, fluorescence bleaching, uh, that those are monomers, and they do see voltage-gated proton conductance uh, through through those uh, channels. But again, that's a big change. So, yeah. Yep. Um, so they were first discovered in snail neurons, and in some human neurons, the channels are expressed, but their function is unknown. Mostly they're seen uh, in immune cells um, and in sperm cells. Um, so the, the, the properties of the gating are such that they can't uh, support action potentials um, because they're outward rectifiers. Um, so 
essentially they ex seem, their main physiological role seems to be uh, proton extrusion out of the cell cytoplasm. Um, yeah, I mean there's some uh, proton channels that have been discovered um, by Tom's lab that are expressed in single-celled uh, algae that do generate, that have quite different gating properties to the uh, eukaryotic, well, I mean not eukaryotic, but higher animal um, proton, voltage-gated proton channels um, that, that uh, aren't outward rectifiers and do propagate action potentials um, and allow for bioluminescence. Um, but, but yeah, the, uh, it's mostly immune cells and in, and in reproductive systems. Um, I'm not sure if, if anyone's looked, but not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay, so we're now to the um, exam. So we're now to the exam, so let's switch on for uh, Jamie to find out the answer to the first one. Thank you.